How are you viewing this clip on your iPhone or on the bus or the train, sitting on a couch in your living room, or while perhaps doing your dishes or eating a snack? And how does that reflect on your understanding of studying, your understanding of eating, and your perception of your bodily functions? Have you ever thought about it? In the social contract, Jean-Jacques Rousseau says man is born free and everywhere he is put in chains. What does Rousseau actually mean by that? What are those metaphorical chains? And how are they related to design? The quick answer would be social norms and conventions. We have already touched upon this topic in previous lectures. However, here we would like to take a deeper look at how design in fact penetrates our very physiognomy. We all know the phrase man is a social animal. This proverb is normally used to accentuate the interactive and social nature of humans. However, it also points to another fact that prior to being social, we are first and foremost animals. This tension between our animalistic nature and our desire to be part of a social construct has been examined by psychologists and sociologists such as Sigmund Freud and Emile Durkheim. In their writings, they explain how social norms are perceived as a way to control our baser needs. Freud, for example, based much of his psychoanalysis theory on the need to observe and understand repressed sexual and bestial needs that belong to the id. Indeed, he defined the id as the animalistic layer of the human psyche and its expression is necessary in Freud's approach in order to obtain a healthier and more harmonized way of being. In his writings, he, he takes as an example the, the oppression of sexual needs and how it is conducted by social and religious norms. Those bestial needs, or the animal part in us, is usually repress, represented in our social imaginaries by the body, which is in many cases out of our reach and control. Mikhail Bakhtin also spoke of our anxieties of the open-edged body, as well as Julia Kristeva will recall the powers of horror and abject our bodies have, and the way of those anxieties and our aim of controlling nature as it is embedded in our own experience. And that is the basis of many of, of our physiological issues. In the same way, by controlling animalistic behavior, it is the body's gestures and the tendencies with which are disciplined and constructed many, in many times around the objects we use. A good example for such a discipline of the body is the ritualistic court manners developed in the high classes societies in France and England. French li literature of the 16th and 17th century, for example, treat the body in many ways as a traitor who is giving away the innermost bestial passions of the cultured human. Further developments of such discipline evolved extensively in Victorian England, where the design of clothes and furniture were very much imbued with an ideology of modesty and severity. Design, as we shall see, has a cardinal part in creating much mechanisms of control. Michel Foucault went further and looked for the socially embedded power relations that surround our seemingly automatic gestures and modes of behavior we tend to take for granted. All that said, when thinking about the ways in which design objects interact and influence our behaviors through our bodies, we wish to try a different path. Thus, we will try to turn to Durkheim's nephew, Marcelmos. As we have seen in previous lectures of this unit, an important feature along the design process, one that is based on understanding the user's needs and constraints by the designer, is ergonomics. By ergonomics, we mean the various ways in which the design object interacts with the user's body, its needs, its constructs, and its features. Furthermore, we will try to keep in mind how such design objects are also looking to maintain the body under discipline or control through the restrictions and allowance of posture and movement within design environments and with the use of design objects. Indeed, following La Corbusier's development of the living machine, i.e. a set of standardized measures used to design the built environment, Henry Dreyfus, in his Designing for People, has outlined a standard of physiologic features the designer needs to follow when addressing this intricate relation between the design object and the user's body. While this standardization process is important when taking into consideration universal physiologic attributes such as limb length, for example, an insight into the influence of the socio-cultural context on the use of design objects was neglected. In analyzing such objects, we would be able to see how designing for a model body, as Dreyfus has suggested, also meant designing for a certain social behavior and norm, while this, the use of objects in different manners could have resulted in restricted emotional applications such as shame, guilt, stigma, and the like. We can also see that starting from the last decades of the 20th century, a growing awareness to such implications of design objects changed the face of design and its definition of ergonomics. In his article titled Techniques of the Body, Moss explores the ways in which we learn how to use our bodies and are educated about bodily functions and gestures by mapping an array of gestures and behaviors conducted every second around the world. 
For example, the way parents educate children how to use a fork and a knife and not place their elbows on the table while eating. If we think further about the ways in which our bodies move throughout the day and what kinds of movements we frequent, we may come to an understanding that in fact many of our movements are assisted by and in many instances conducted by the objects we use. Just consider for example a simple object like a cellular phone's earphones. While the function is indeed to converse and in later applications listen to music on the phone, their presence influenced a variety of gestures, the way we walk, our gaze, hand movements in correlation to how we carry our phone, either in our bag or in our pocket. Most identify this connection between our movements and our bodily function as well as the parallel between the body and an instrument in use. As he writes in the same article, the body is man's first and most natural instrument, or more accurately, not to speak of instruments, man's first and most natural technical object, and at the same time, technical means is his body. Indeed, Moss highlights the variations in eating norms, sleeping, etc., in relation to the influences of gender, culture, and age, and how these are mediated and constructed by design. As an example, he is contemplating on the simple task of resting or digesting food. Rest can be perfect rest or a mere suspension of activity, lying down, sitting, squatting, etc. etc. Try squatting while you realize the torture that a Moroccan meal, for example, eaten according to for all the rituals, would cause you. The way of sitting down is fundamental. You can distinguish squatting mankind and sitting mankind. And in the latter, people are that use benches and people without benches or daises, people with chairs and people without any chairs. Wooden chairs supported by crouching figures and widespread, curiously enough, in the region at the 15 degree of latitude north and along the equator in both continents. There are people who have tables and people who do not. As we can see in Moss's quote, not only do social norms affect design, but design objects help in maintaining and further stabilizing social norms. Through changing the ways of our bodies behave, such habitual gestures change completely our relationship to physical presence such as digestion and rest. In one single gesture, the way we sit or eat our dinner, much of our social habits, including our eating habits and our conception of food, is embodied. At the same time that our sitting, lying, crouching changes the way we digest according to the type of food we eat. It also reflects on gastropolitics or the politics constructed through our eating rituals. Indeed, following the breakthrough of Marcel Moss's essay, various researchers from an array of disciplines discussed the many aspects of what would be termed the social body. From the fractured body through the docile body to the posthuman body, these new venues hold many important issues to designers.